take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. Bibles open to Mark chapter 5, and then I want you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 5, we're going to read verses 21 down to verse 28. If you'll turn to Mark 5 and stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. I know you're comfortable seated there. Just remember, I have to stand the whole service. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, Much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse, when she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. May God bless his word to our heart. Let's bow for prayer. Father, Help us to see the beauty of Christ in this passage, and may it motivate us with a holy desperation to reach out to our Savior in faith and touch him. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to talk about desperate for his touch. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you desperate for a touch of Christ in your life, a touch of God? Desperate situation calls for desperate measures. It's an old saying. And what Mark chapter 5 gives us here are some desperate situations where people act in, we could say, a holy desperation. That's really what we want to talk about, is a holy desperation for God. Now, the, the dictionary definition for desperation is a state of despair, typically one that results in rash or extreme behavior. Now, the world may look at desperation as a bad thing, but there's a sense in which for a believer, a holy desperation of God is actually a good thing. Because it's when we come to God and we place our total dependence and faith in God, we act with a great faith when we come to God with this holy desperation. It moves, I I think that when we come to God in this type of desperation, it moves the hand of God, it moves the heart of God on our, on our behalf. Uh, Jeremiah says this, uh, when, you call, when you call me, when you go to pray to me, I will listen. I will, when you look to me, you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart. When in desperation you go to God seeking him with all your heart, he says, I will respond. I will respond. Now, we said before that Mark chapter 5 is really we call this the, um, the chapter, the St. Jude chapter of, uh, of the gospel because St. Jude is the patron saint for hopeless causes. And some people look at this chapter and they see several hopeless causes in here. But Jesus changes all of that. Uh, he replaces hopelessness with hope. And so I want you to see here in this passage the actions of Jesus in response to these supposed hopeless situations and what the Lord does when people reach out with kind of a holy desperation. It may be that you're here this morning and you say, man, I have a desperate situation in my life. There's really nothing I can do from my end, humanly speaking. It's out of my hands. And what I need is I need for the Lord to intervene. I need God to do something. Well, this is a good chapter for us to learn from and, and what holy desperation does. So here's the first thing. If you're taking notes, write down, we're going to look at a desperate ruler. Holy desperation prays with extraordinary humility. That's the first thing that we see here, an extraordinary humility. And look in chapter 5, verse 21. Remember, Jesus had just been to the country of Gadara. (coughs) He had cast out demons. 
in a man. We remember we saw him last time we looked at Mark. Uh, his name, we called him Legion because there were many demons in him, and Jesus cast out those demons. And the next time we see this man, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. But the people in that country said, Jesus, would you please leave? They were actually uh, afraid, more afraid of Jesus than they were the demons. And they said, Jesus, leave. And so Jesus got into the boat, and he comes now to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And I think he gets out of the boat somewhere close to Capernaum, which I think was the headquarters of Jesus' ministry at, at this time of his life in the area of Galilee. He stayed at the home of Peter. So they get out of the boat there by the Sea of Galilee, by Capernaum. And look what it says in verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat, there close to Capernaum, there are people there that are waiting. And one man runs out of the crowd. The Bible identifies him. I want you to see his responsibility because it says he's one of the rulers of the synagogue. And uh, his name is Jairus. And when the Bible uses the, the word ruler, it's, it's a really a big compound word. And the, the sum of it is, is that he's the highest ranking official in the synagogue there. Now, I've been to Capernaum. And there in Capernaum, there's the ruins of a big synagogue right there just off the Sea of Galilee. And archaeologists have dug there, and they found adjacent to that synagogue, they found a, a parsonage, a house, which many scholars identify as the home of Jairus, who was the chief ruler in the synagogue at that time, a very important position, a very high-ranking member of the religious establishment. Some scholars think that he was a Pharisee himself. And it's this man that comes to Jesus as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat. Now, you have to remember that at this time in Jesus' ministry, hostility is building against the Lord. And a lot of that hostility comes from where? It comes from the religious leaders. It comes from the Pharisees themselves. They were there. They saw some of the miracles of Jesus, but they don't give Jesus credit. They say that he does it in some other power, the power of Satan. So there's this hostility building. But yet here's one religious leader. One Pharisee, who when Jesus comes, what does the Bible says that he does in verse 22? And he fell at his feet, it says at the end of verse number 22. He falls at his feet. Now think about this. Here, this is a, not, he's not just by himself. He's with a crowd of people. No doubt there are other Pharisees there. And here's Jairus, and he runs forward... And he falls down at the feet of Jesus. Now what this tells me is that already in his own mind, he had made a conclusion about who Jesus is. We see his responsibility, we see his reverence here. Matthew uses the word for worship, to kiss towards. It's a word reserved for the worship of God. So who does this man Jairus think that Jesus is? He's, in Jairus' mind, he's not just an ordinary man. He is who he claims himself to be. And he falls down before Jesus. You know, he reminds me in this of Nicodemus. Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And what did he say? Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do what you do unless God be with him. And he was talking about all the miracles that he saw in Jesus. I think Jairus was there in Capernaum. He perhaps was there in the house when the man was lowered down through the roof and Jesus healed him. He may have been there to see Peter's mother-in-law healed. And I'm sure he saw many people healed there in Capernaum as Jesus would heal all of the sick. And when he saw all these things, he knew that this man Jesus was not just any ordinary man, that there was something different about him. And now he throws aside any pride that he might have, any religious pride. And in the midst of the crowd and perhaps many of his peers around, he falls down on his face before the Lord Jesus with great humility. What caused him to do that? Look at verse 23. And he besought him greatly saying, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. He believed with all his heart that if Jesus would just come to his home, 
and lay his hands on his little daughter that she would live. That's what he believed about Jesus, that he was God and that he could help. And you know what holy desperation does? It throws aside all pride and it casts itself down before Jesus with great humility. I want to ask, have you ever done that? Where you've laid aside all pride, not thinking what anyone else, not caring what anyone else thinks, I should say. And you fall down before Jesus in holy desperation because you need him at this moment in your life. I remember that I was at the hospital, University of Maryland, a while back, several years ago. Uh, there was a young man that was in a very serious accident. It was very touch and go. And I was asked to go there, and I went to uh, the shock trauma unit there at the University of Maryland and went up to the room where this young man was laying in a bed, and there were 10 doctors around that bed, and they were all trying to figure out what they could do to help this young man in this desperate situation. And the father of this young man was there, and the father, uh, with tears in his eyes, said to all the doctors there, Let me, this is what we're going to do. He's, literally, his words were this, this is how I roll. He said, we're going to call upon the name of the Lord to help. And he dropped down on his knees there, right there in the middle of shock trauma with all those doctors around, not caring. He didn't care one whit what anyone thought. His son was at the verge of death. And he needed something more than, thank God for doctors and hospitals, by the way. Thank God for what they do. But friend, every once in a while, we need something beyond that. We're only... The only thing that, we, that can really help in that situation is the touch of the Lord. And he threw, he threw himself down in great humility and begged the Lord in prayer with tears. Those doctors standing there didn't know what to think. They also didn't know what to think when, when the boy lived and he was healed and the Lord moved in. That's the kind of humility and desperation that moves the hand of God. And this is what we see here in this story. This man, this religious leader falls down at the feet of Jesus saying, my daughter, she lies at the point of death. If you will just come, and if you will just touch her, she will live. I believe that she will live. If I can just have your touch, Lord. You know, the Lord responds to that kind of humility. The Bible says this in Isaiah 57, 15. Thus says the high and the holy one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place. But I'm also with the contrite and the lowly of spirit in order to revive the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. God says, when I see your brokenness and when I see that humility and when you come to me in brokenness and humility, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. And that's what we see here in this story. Some of you right here, right today, you're in a desperate situation. There's really nothing you can do. I don't know what it is. The Lord knows your problem. He knows everything about it. It may be a difficult marriage, a rebellious child, a person's health problem. It could be a loss of job, some kind of financial setback. Whatever the situation is, you need God to act on your behalf. I would encourage you to learn from this example here that the God responds to a humble, holy desperation when you come to him. Because look what happens as a result. Look in verse 24. And Jesus went with him. I love that. He stopped whatever he was doing, and he went immediately with him. You know, the Lord responds. This man secures the presence of Christ for his situation. You know what? You just need to take Jesus home with you today. He'll come with you. He'll help you in that situation. He responds to faith. The Lord is never too busy to come to you and help you out in that situation. And so we see then holy desperation prays with extraordinary humility. Again, have you done that? Have you, have you fallen before the Lord? Have you come in humility and said, Lord, I need you. Nothing else can do. Not caring what others think, you just come to him. But here's the second part of this story. We see a diseased woman, not only a desperate ruler, but a diseased woman. And I want you to see another lesson. Holy desperation acts with extraordinary faith. Because look at verse 25. Now Jesus is leaving to go with this man. And the Bible says in verse 24, with him there were many people that followed. There's a crowd of people around Jesus. And you can kind of picture this in your mind. They're kind of thronging around him. And he's kind of making his way to the home of 
this man Jairus. And as he's on his way, the Bible says in verse 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him and touched his garment. Here's another desperate situation. Here's in this crowd, there's this woman in the Bible talks about, notice her condition. She had an issue of blood of 12 years. This is a woman in a terrible condition. She was hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. Physically, this was an incredibly, you know, you can imagine how difficult problem this must have been for 12 years. She had had this issue of hemorrhaging blood. Socially, it was no doubt a source of continual embarrassment because according to Jewish law, she was ceremonially unclean. Because of this, which meant that she couldn't really participate in a lot of the religious festivals and a lot of Jewish life was centered around these kind of ceremonial things that took place, which meant that she was separated, she was ostracized from community. Anything that she touched was unclean. She, she couldn't go to the synagogue. She couldn't go to the temple. She was an outcast. If she touched her husband, he was unclean. If she touched her children... They were unclean. Whatever she touched was considered unclean. So you can imagine how difficult this was for her at this time in her life. She was literally cut off from society. And medically, she had, she had done all that she could. The Bible tells us, as we just read, that in verse 20, 26, she had suffered many things of many physicians. She had gone to doctor after doctor. And many of them didn't make things better. Some of them may have made things worse. It said she suffered at the hands of physicians. How many of you know that sometimes, although we thank God for doctors, sometimes they can't help us? And sometimes it may even get worse. And by the way, med medical science in this day was little more than just superstitious potions. It wasn't nowhere near what we have today. The Talmud proposed 11 different remedies for this kind of situation, including drinking a goblet of wine containing a powder made from rubber, alum, and other kind of garden spices. Another potion was made from the Persian onions cooked in wine. Here's another remedy that was, I looked up from this time. It says, um, if that didn't work, they were to set her in a place where two ways met and let her hold a cup of wine in her right hand and let, it, let someone come up behind her and frighten her. Well, that should work. Let's just scare her to death. See if that works. Another remedy, according to the Talmud, was to carry the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen bag in the summer and to carry the ashes of an ostrich egg bag in a cotton bag in the winter or carry a barley corn found in donkey dung. That's medical science. That doesn't say a lot for the Galilean Medical Association, does it? Those kind of remedies. And the Bible says in verse 26, she spent all she had. She was so desperate that she spent all the money she had. And by the way, those doctors back then are kind of like doctors today. No refund. Sorry. Didn't work. Rough. Sorry about that. Bummer. She didn't get her money back. She had spent all. Everything she had. She had nothing left to spend. Luke, in his account, remember Luke's a doctor in his gospel account, he just simply says she could not be healed. There was nothing that men could do to heal her of this at this time. And so emotionally, she's very sad. We can only imagine how distraught she was at this situation, at that, this condition. She was desperate. But when she heard that Jesus was back, and when she saw him, and she saw the crowd around him, Faith welled up inside of her because she believed in who Jesus was, who he claimed to be. And she had watched him heal other people. She had watched him fix other desperate situations. And she said, she said this, the Bible says in her heart, look in verse 28, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. This is an amazing woman. She said, if I can just reach out and just touch, and later on Mark will say, the hem of his garment. If I can just touch that, then I could be made whole. Now again, 
She shouldn't even be in public according to Leviticus. But she had nothing to lose. She was desperate. So she presses through the crowd. She didn't want to be noticed for obvious reasons. She didn't want people to point her out. But very quietly, as quietly as she could, she reached out and looked at verse 29 and straightway, when she touched him and straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. When she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment, the Bible says immediately she was healed. Immediately. That's incredible. Now, the question I asked when I studied this passage was, what was so special about the, the hem of his garment? What was so special about that? Well, did you know that in ancient Israel, men wore kind of a tunic that had four corners to it? It was tied in knots, uh, 613 knots to be exact, which represented the law of God. It represented the word of God, or we could say the promises of God. And did you also know that in ancient Israel, uh, the, the tassels that hung from the hem of a garment represented the authority of that individual, that particular individual. And by the way, each tribe seemed to have their own little seal that they would put on their, their garment, the hem of their garment. And I can just imagine when she saw the hem of his garment, of the Lord Jesus, that was really a symbol of his authority, of who he was. You might remember the story in the Old Testament of David when he was hiding in a cave in Gedi. Saul was hunting him, remember that? And, and David was hiding here in, in a cave. And Saul went to, to relieve himself in a cave. And there was David. He didn't know David was hidden there. And there's Saul. And what does the Bible say David did? He reached for us and he cut just a part of his robe off, just the hem of his robe. You know what he was cutting off? A tassel there of his robe. You know why? That represented the authority of the king. In a way, you know what David was saying? This, your authority is going to be turned over to me. I'm the new anointed king, and this authority is mine. And of course, you know that afterwards when that happened, the Bible says that David's heart smote him. He got a bad conscience about it. And when Saul left the cave, David went and knelt behind him. But anyway, that, that little act that David did was symbolic of, a, of an authority that was going to be transferred over to me because the hem of the garment, the tassel on the hem of the garment stood for the authority of that individual. So when she saw Jesus and she saw the hem of his garment, and she saw the tassel there. All that stood for was the promises of God's word and the authority that he had as who? The son of David, who was the Messiah, the son of God. She believed all that about them, and she said, if I can just touch that hem of his garment, I believe I will be healed. Her faith was not just in any superstition. This is not magical superstition here. This is her faith in who Jesus was. And this is faith in the promises of God's word. You know, the Bible, there's a prophecy in the Old Testament in Malachi that says that when the Son of God will come, He will come with healing in His wings. And the word for wings there is the fringe of a garment. Healing in His fringes, in the hem of His garment. And Luke was very specific in his gospel where it says she came behind Him and touched the border of of his garment. She reached forth and she touched it. And you know what? She was immediately cured. Notice her cure. It was immediate in verse 29. Look at verse 30. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and saith thou who touched me? This is the only time in the Gospels where I read where the disciples were a little bit irritated at Jesus here. They're saying, you're asking who touched you? Seriously? I mean, there's people bumping you and jostling you all around. There's this huge crowd here. And you're asking who touched you? But this wasn't a normal touch. This was the touch of faith. And look at verse number 32, and he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. Actually, back up to verse 30, I want you to see this. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about the press and said, who touched my clothes? You know why Jesus knew someone touched him? Because he felt a transfer of power at that moment. 
He felt virtue leave him. Now, I don't think it left Jesus without power because you can't, you can't shorten the power of Almighty God. He's omnipotent. He just felt a little bit of transfer of that power. Go to this woman who reached out in faith. And by the way, beloved, I believe that when we come to Christ in faith, in desperation, and we reach out in faith, and, and, and believe knowing that who he is, believing in the promises of his word, and we get in touch with him in prayer, I believe there's a transfer of power that takes place to the child of God. Do you need grace today? Do you need power today? Do you need strength today? Reach out in faith and touch him. Holy desperation acts in extraordinary faith. This woman had an extraordinary faith, and she reached out, and she touched him, and power had gone out from Jesus to her. And verse 32, when he saw this woman, look at verse 33, the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. She perhaps was a little afraid, thinking that, you know, maybe because of her condition, when she was, she was in the crowd, she was a bit apologetic, but Jesus commended her and said, great is your faith. Your faith has made you whole. And he calls her daughter. This is the only time that Jesus calls a woman daughter here in uh, the New Testament. And I think that he's doing that to affirm that not only did, was she healed physically, but she became a child of God by faith. In fact, the word sozo is used here, which speaks about salvation. Not only did she get healed physically, but she was made whole sozo spiritually, and she became a child of God, and Jesus commends her because of her faith. And by the way, you know what? This woman goes from being infamous to famous. She becomes an example to many other believers who in desperation go to the Lord, because I want you to look at this real quick. Look at Mark chapter 6. And I want you to look down at verse number 53. Look at this real quickly with me. This is later on. This is in Gennesaret, a plain three miles uh, by one mile, uh, right up against the shore of the Lake of Galilee, right by Capernaum. Not far from Capernaum. Look at verse 53. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to shore. Verse 54. And when they were come out of the ship straightway, they knew him. Here's Jesus again. Gets out of the boat. Verse 55. They know him. They we're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.